call to order our special meeting for Monday, October 3rd um, of the Hermosa Beach Planning Commission. May we have uh, Pete Hoffman to lead us in the pledge. Please, uh, please join me. <clears throat> Place your hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, all right. Thank you. May we have our roll call, please? Certainly. Commissioner Marie Rice? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Saman? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Hoffman? Here. Vice Chair Izant? Here. And Chair Peterson. Here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All present. Um, we'll now head to um, section four, which is public participation, oral and written communication. I'll let staff lead us in that. So although the Planning Commission values your comments, the Brown Act generally prohibits the Planning Commission from acting on any matter not listed on the posted agenda as a business item. This is the time for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on any items within the Commission's jurisdiction, not on this agenda or items on this agenda. Please note that the Planning Commission does not engage in dialogue during public comment, and each speaker is limited to three minutes per speaker. If you are joining the meeting by phone, please remember to dial star six in order to unmute yourself. Participants joining by internet, please remember to unmute and please state your name for the record before starting your comment. Thank you. All right, um, oral communication. We don't have anyone in chambers here to speak. Is there anyone online? Yes, we have um, Laura Penna. Let me just pull up the timer here. I'll ask her to unmute herself. Give me one moment. <clears throat> can you hear us, Laura? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. welcome. You guys are in public. I mean, you, you guys are in person. Thank you for that. Um, hello, I want to thank the commissioners, staff, and Martha Milla again for all their work with the citywide standards. I especially want to thank Melanie and Christy, who were very helpful in clarifying and updating the staff report in regards to today's meeting. Since it pertained to the meeting, I was surprised that my email was not added to the written public comment section today so that the public could be updated to the, to the issues that uh, we have this weekend. My comments in the opening section right now relate to the general process of how we are updating and keeping the public informed as it relates to the comprehensive zoning code updates. I hope I'm allowed to speak um, if necessary during the item um, because this is just general in nature. From our last meeting on September 22nd, the planning commissioners addressed several issues raised by the public as well as their own concerns that needed further clarification. And, I, and as I see in the updated PowerPoint, there will be additional questions that will be addressed. I feel it would be helpful if the public had a better understanding of when our written or verbal public comments will be addressed uh, by the planning commissioners or staff, since a lot of the written feedback was not addressed at all, and especially when it came, comes to the non-residential. So as we did in our land use follow-up meeting in April, we were provided a red track change document. And so the public could see what changes um, staff or Martha Miller were doing so that we could provide additional feedback. In today's draft citywide standard document, it does not include that. So asking the public to read the 80 page document again to provide additional feedback is not efficient and it's not very effective. So going forward, if we could see these changes in, in real time, that would be incredibly helpful. And, and again, just allowing us a, a better understanding of how we can participate in providing you feedback, which, you know, a lot has been incorporated. So I really wanna thank you for that. Um, but a couple of the issues we had were a lot of the links um, to uh, the meetings weren't, weren't working this weekend. So it really uh, forced the public um, they didn't really have a lot of access to all the information. So that may be why people aren't contributing today. But again, I just wanted to provide that as an opening uh, general public comment. So thank you. 
All right, thank you, Laura. Noted. Um, do we have any other? I don't see anyone's hands raised. Um, I will allow, I'll see if anyone else wants to speak at this matter. Please raise your hand on the Zoom webinar, please. See if John Davis wants to speak. I don't. And a reminder, we will be taking public comment after Martha's presentation as well, so. Hello. Hi, John. Yeah, hi. Davis? I actually did want to speak somehow. Somehow I got that, but I will say something. So I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, actually, I have more of a question. I don't know if I'll have the opportunity to speak later because that would be my preference. You. You can speak later. We're going to receive well, Martha's presentation and then solicit public speak comment. Later. We'll go to. Oops, hello. Hello. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I, I heard uh, what you said is I can't speak later. I think I'd prefer to do that because then I can uh, listen carefully and then give some input. So thank you. I'll, I'll speak later. Okay, John, we'll look for you. Thank you. Sure. At this time, um, again, if anyone wants to speak during the public participation before the presentation, please raise your hand. The dramatic pause. Anyone? I don't see anyone at this time. Okay, we will close public participation at this time. Um, I will note that we received numerous um, written communications as part of our um, meeting packet. Can I get a motion to receive and file? So move. Second. Okay, we have a motion to receive and file from Commissioner Seaman, um, seconded by Commissioner Hoffman. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Rice. Yes. Commissioner Seaman. Yes. Commissioner Hoffman. Yes. Vice Chair Isaac. Yes. And Chair Peterson. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to um, section five, review and discussion. Um, part A or section A, um, information only or public meeting notice is uh, provided for your review and notice. Uh, moving on to item B, which is the uh, meat of why we're here, uh, comprehensive zoning code update citywide standards. I see Martha Miller ready to go. Um, I don't know if staff wants to introduce her. Or I can introduce you directly, but this is um, follow up to our September meeting. Um, to make sure that we have adequately reflected our public comment as well as the sentiment of our group. Um, so we're gonna receive the presentation from Martha as we did last time, and this should be a lot more brisk, but if anyone has questions um, of, of staff, if any of our commissioners have questions, um, bring those, then we'll solicit public comment. And then only after we've heard public comment, will we as a group deliberate and share um, additional comments. We are not taking any formal action tonight. We're not taking any votes. This is um, part of our informational and iterative process toward the final product. So without Martha or good. Martha if you wish to go ahead, you may. Yeah. Welcome okay. back. Sounds good. Thank you. It's good to be back for the follow-up meeting on um, the citywide standard. So to follow up our meeting in September, just to kind of report back on what we heard, make sure we heard correctly, and um, kind of uh, continue some items that kind of were left, asked for more information. So the um, just bring everybody back to what we're doing. The project is an update to the zoning and subdivision ordinances intended to effectively implement Plan Hermosa and the community's vision for the future. Um, and we started the project with an assessment of your current ordinances and through that assessment had some recommendations uh, to move forward with a work plan and now we're on the actual update of the ordinances where we started first with some targeted parking amendments and then we've been working through preliminary drafts of regulations um, in study sessions with the planning commission so we've gone through use regulations, we've gone through district and design standards, 
Uh, we introduced the citywide standards and had discussion at the last uh, planning commission study session in September, and this is the follow up to that. Uh, the next major section we'll be talking about is administrative provisions before we make revisions, put everything together into a complete draft um, and take another look at that, make revisions and then go forward with a formal hearing and adoption process. So the citywide standards are standards that apply to one or multiple or multiple all or multiple districts throughout the city and they cover a variety of topics, including affordable housing density bonus and incentive program, uh, condominiums, historic resource preservation, non-conforming provisions, off-street parking, performance standards, signs, and your open space overlay district. We don't have revised language for you um, tonight, but the when we do bring forward a complete draft of the ordinances, um, the revised language will be reflected in that. And we do intend to do a track changes version so everybody can see what you know the progression has been from the preliminary draft of standards to the next version and, and as we move forward. But we did want to kind of uh, report back um, kind of what we heard, what we thought there was direction on in case, um, you know, just to let you know that we heard and then if there was anything that we missed that you could bring up. But that includes um, clarifying that it's really just the city it can only nominate city properties as historic. So any nominations of private property to be uh, designated as a historic resource must come from the landlord and that is stemmed in um, policy direction that the city established back with Plan Hermosa. Another piece was revised language for the measurement of vibration. And there's um, to clarify that and make sure that was clear and measurable. And just a side note on this, the city is also working on um, an update to another title that addresses um, similar, if not some of the same issues that or items that this section uh, addresses. So we'll be working with the staff working on that to make sure there isn't overlap or redundancy and those um, are clear and measurable as well. So just a little side note on the evolution um, that that may be taking. Um, we did here to maintain the existing residential parking requirements, which is two spaces plus one guest, guest space per unit. Um, reduce the minimum width of qualifying parking lot landscaping islands to three feet. And that was really to be consistent with other measurements related to landscaping. So there is consistency throughout those types of provisions. Um, allow all uh, non-conforming structures and uses that are destroyed due to um, a, kind of a, a, a disaster or a kind of act of God as they call it um, to be reestablished subject to the rules in place, except non-conforming parking may continue. So you wouldn't have to, if you were non-conforming as to parking, you wouldn't need to make up that difference. Um, clarify the definition of abandonment and vacation of non-conforming uses, as well as allow signs that advertise former businesses, kind of like legacy businesses that were on that same property to remain. And then there were some items that we wanted to bring back to follow up on information or bring forward for discussion. And the first one was AB 2097 related to parking. And that was what one um, commenter brought up as far as uh, questions on how the city would be addressing this or making sure that the city addressed it. And so this is a um, new recent legislation that will take effect in January of 2023. And what it basically establishes is that the city may not um, require minimum parking, uh, may not establish minimum parking requirements within one half mile of a quote unquote uh, major transit stop. And um, people, developers may provide parking if they choose, but the city cannot mandate it in those areas. So the city is um, analyzing what that definition of major transit stop is and uh, the applicability within Hermosa Beach. And I'm not sure if um, the city staff or the attorney was able to 
kind of come to resolution or wanted to weigh in on that, but um, that's kind of the status of, of that piece of it. Can I ask you a quick question on that? When, when there's an overlay or kind of an override by the state, do, do we change our local code or we, do we just sort of put a comment that that supersedes it or how do we go about that? Because I know we're, it's not the first time this has happened. I'm just not sure how we do it. Yeah, it, it kind of depends. Some of the state laws might conflict only in certain cases. And, and in that case, we would make some text amendments. Um, but even if we didn't change our code, that state law would still supersede our local code anyway. Sure. Um, but it's typically best practice to align our code with the newest legislation. So as soon as we get a better handle on the applicability of, of this bill to Hermosa Beach, we'll certainly bring that back to the Planning Commission and then make any changes as necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second piece related to parking as well is talking about alternative parking designs. And so the Planning Commission, um, you know, while um, said that the parking actual requirements for residential parking would stay the same, but there was support for alternative parking designs such as tandem parking and mechanical lifts. So there are uh, provisions, allowances for tandem parking in the um, draft standards, as well as for mechanical lifts. And regarding mechanical lifts, it really at this point carries forward existing provisions, which um, allow mechanical lifts in certain situations. So on smaller lots, uh, the lifts may be used for required parking spaces. Whereas on lots greater than 20, 100 square feet, the mechanical lifts can be used, but they don't, uh, they can only be used for additional parking. So parking spaces provided above and beyond what the requirements are. So the planning commission may choose to kind of support the continuation of that, or some options for consideration would be to allow mechanical lifts for required residential parking spaces on any size lot. So kind of expanding that, except maintaining the exclusion of using, you know, you can't use mechanical lifts for guest parking. Um, and then another thing to consider, it would be allowing mechanical lifts to be used for required non-residential parking with something like a parking plan approval or something where uh, the city could be assured of management and maintenance so that, that those parking spaces would be um, accessible and available. Um, also related to parking, uh, Planning Commission asked staff just to take a second look at the bicycle parking requirements to see if there's any refinements that maybe should be made in consideration of the some of the discussion we had and some looking at best practices. And um, one area maybe, and I think one of the commenters in, in one of the comment letters brought this up as well, could revise that long-term parking location requirements to allow more flexibility. So um, as written, they're required to be on site, but also um, visible from the entrance to the building. So uh, that could be revised not to have it be visible from the entrance. When we think about long-term parking, it may be that somebody, um, you know, would en enter the building and the bicycle parking may be um, in a separate room or a separate area. So that could allow some flexibility. Um, regarding non-conforming, uh, so the replacement of non-conforming uses and the time frame for that. So current provisions allow non-conforming uses that have been vacated or discontinued um, they can be reestablished within 90 days. So there's just a 90 day window from the time a non-conforming use start, stops and you know the time it could be reestablished. And um, there was support expressed for allowing a longer period of time to accommodate you know, things that um, to get permits, to find a new tenant, to get um, business licenses and so on, get up and running. Um, so staff looked at the review times and recommends um, allowing a six month time frame. Um, in addition to that six month time frame, allowing an additional six months um, that the director may approve. And so 
with that extension, the non-conforming use really would have a, a maximum of 12 months to be reestablished. So the first six months time frame, just um, kind of by right, and then the uh, potential for an extension of that up to six months with director approval. And then the kind of reestablishment period would begin um, when one, any two of the following occur. So when we talked last meeting, it was uh, as drafted, it says, um, you know, uh, a use is considered to be vacated or abandoned when one of the following occurs. And um, there was some question with that was a little uh, kind of too constraining. So to loosen that up a bit, it would be when any of the two occurs. So whether it's Sites vacated, the business license lapsed, utilities are terminated, um, or the lease being terminated. Um, the next piece was on condominiums, and there was a requirement in actually in your existing condominium provisions that conversion provisions that was carried forward, which required um, the applicant to agree to waive the right to protest the formation of an underground utility district. And this was one where we were looking into context and I'll um, pass it to staff if see if there was um, anything to report back on that. Great, thank you, Martha. Uh, so the city attorney's office did look into this and their feeling was that this language was really a carryover provision um, prior to some previous propositions that have since been passed. Um, which now require an undergrounding district um, where affirmative votes outweigh the negative votes. Um, if an undergrounding district was an issue and something that was extremely relevant to a specific project, if we had a condominium conversion case, for example, we could always address that um, in the project conditions as conditions of approval. But it is the city attorney's um, recommendation that that language be removed from the revised code section because it's unnecessary in their view. Mr. Chair, follow up on that. I spoke with someone afterwards and the comment was they thought this, and I don't know how their memory, but their thought was the reason this was placed was that a building which was previously had a single owner and therefore got a single vote, if it became a condominium, take the Victorian, which has 40 units or something, suddenly you had 40 owners voting it really only represented one footage in what would be the entire district and that that's what this was intended to avoid was sort of over-representation of a condominium complex. If one of the big apartment buildings in the South End, for example, condominiumized, suddenly you had 50 property owners voting that really only represented one block frontage or something in the district. But I, I like I say, that was a secondhand recollection. So I don't know. That, that sounds like it makes sense. Um, I don't know if we have, I know our assistant city attorney, Donegan, wasn't able to be with us tonight, but he did have a colleague joining us. So I don't know if um, John would, would like to weigh in on that. Hi, thanks everybody. Um... It's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm covering for Pat, so I'm, I'm sorry you guys are stuck with me tonight, but um, thank you for, for having me. Um, so I talked with, with Pat, and, and Pat's comments were essentially what were just reported. Um, I, I don't think I have anything else to add. Um, the commissioner's comments about the potential, um, I, I guess, background on it, I, I can't speak to that, but um, it's our office's opinion that at this point, the the language and the code regarding this is is unnecessary and um, and should be removed. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have anything else besides that. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, uh, Commissioner Hoffman brought up an interesting point, and uh, I'm reminded of some years ago when my own block was undergrounded. And I think the rule at that time was is that each lot had one vote in the uh, whether we underground or not, but it never occurred to me that we have quite a few kind of mediums that were two units on one lot, and so I'm wondering if, when it's just two units, uh, do both owners have a voice because it is common ground that there are two owners. So we're kind of back to the same question. It's it's more obvious when it's forty or fifty, of course, but 
when it's just two, does each owner get a vote? The way things are now, does each owner get a vote for an underground? Uh, Chair Peterson, I would make the observation that it all depends on if the district was formed and would each owner have to pay their own individual share or would it be one share for that lot divided by the two owners? That would be an indication to me on, on how that works. The other observation that I would make, although this is perhaps more appropriate in the comments section, is that I had not thought of the issue of, let's say that a district is in the process of being formed, um, or that is the vote has not yet occurred. Uh, there is a owner of a property that has uh, 10 properties or 10 uh, units. Uh, he's converting them to condos. He has sold six units. Would those six units now be able to vote? And under this statute, he would not because he is making the conversion. Which, uh, again, I, I go back to the issue of, of fairness. If a, an apartment owner next door, whether they have two apartments or 20 apartments, if that plot owner gets a vote, why shouldn't the plot owner next door get a vote just because he happens to be converting it? So I'm in total agreement with the city attorney's position, and I don't think I'm sharing a confidence out of school. Uh, I did have a conversation with Councillor Donegan this afternoon on this issue, and he thought actually the city would not be able to defend it. Hmm. Now, that's not in the official report, uh, but that was what he shared with me. And so I might not be able to defend this waiver or not be able to defend the language as currently written in the ordinance. Okay. So I think we're inviting unnecessary trouble by retaining this. Okay. Um, yeah, it sounds like there's a need for some additional nuance to, you know, how many units and, you know, no votes versus too many votes. So, all right, Martha. Uh, the next was the potentially historic structures. And just as a follow-up to discussion at the study session, on the existence of a list of potentially historic structures. So the city does not maintain or recognize any list of potentially historic structure resources. And, um, you know, as such the draft regulations or, you know, any mention of that will be deleted. So we'll clean that language up. Um, this is for the discussion if there was anything else to discuss and, but before, Kind of we turn it over. I, I do want to um, kind of follow up on just some other items. So there were uh, people who submitted letters and comments. And again, we really appreciate that. We appreciate people looking at the drafts, um, critiquing them, you know, asking questions, reading them, because there are things that need to be um, either policy items raised for the Planning Commission to consider or just corrections, technical deficiencies, and so on. So um, I just want to mention that there will also be um, revisions to correct different items um, raised in the comment letters, including there's incorrect references to structures and some non-conforming provisions that should have really just been to non-conforming uses. Um, the RC district should have been included in the parking provisions that um, currently through the targeted parking amendments apply in the downtown and C1 district. So that was just a, a translation that didn't get carried over correctly. Um, remove potential bedrooms from the parking calculation, um, allowing offsite parking within a quarter mile of areas currently in um, areas designated as SPA 11 that was supposed to, that current allowance was supposed to be carried forward and then um, carry forward current parking requirements for short-term vacation rentals. So in respect though to um, seeing changes and, and track changes of what's been incorporated and, and not, as I said, we will include that in the draft um, ordinances. I did wanna say that, you know, we're continuing to accept, you know, and we encourage people to comment on things. So even, if we already had the study sessions on use regulations, you know, people can still look back at them and comment and we encourage them to do that. So we're continuing to look back at things and test things and 
uh, make sure things are correct. And, um, you know, the, the kind of comment period is by, by no means over. So, um, yeah, just continue to look at them and anything that, that comes in does get consideration and, um, becomes part of the record. So with that, um, then I will just pass it back to the staff if there's any closing remarks for the presentation. Does not appear so. Um, does I know we've discussed some of the items. Does anyone else have any like specific technical questions or can we go to public comment, which would be my preference? All right, let's 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 go to public comment. I'm guessing we have two, maybe more. Uh, Marisol, if you could open it up. Sure, we have a a hand raised for Sahil Gandhi. Let me see if they're available to speak. Hi, you hear me? Yes. Hey. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sahil Gandhi. I'm here representing Mark Bogor. Uh, the owner of the commercial site on the Strand, just north of Pier Avenue, as well as the site on the corner of Formosa Avenue and 14th Street. Um, running up code update. Uh, it's going to be a significant positive impact for the Hermosa Beach community. Um, to talk about uh, the mechanical automobile lifts, it states that the lifts must be located within a fully enclosed garage. Um, appropriate for residential areas, but in commercial areas, um, requirement that should be dropped since the outdoor stackers are needed um, to to fully take advantage of of what that technology can provide. Um, as far as the appearance of those stackers, they're really nice ways of covering up the parking with public art. Um, Water table being so high in this area, going underground is not not is uh, very important for I'm sorry, it seems like you're up. breaking up a bit. Can you hear us? Yeah. Hello? You still there? So you're you were cutting out and we've lost the last. 10, 15 seconds, so I don't know. Well, uh, so I was, I was saying uh, that uh, uh, our, our uh, automobile lifts should, should be, uh, you know, not enclosed in the commercial areas. Um, there's, a, there's a water table uh, that's, that's high. Ground is not an option. Um, so, so being able to to put uh, unenclosed outdoor uh, stackers is I wanted to to revisit. And I know uh, this meeting is for uh, the citywide, but I, I wanted to just quickly revisit uh, our, our meeting back in. You know, you're breaking up, break sir. You, I'm not sure if the problem is on your end or ours. You said that you wanted to revisit a previous meeting and then. I wanted what to just. It is connection. Uh, okay. I, I want to just. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to just, just revisit um, the 1.25 uh, maximum FAR for, for commercial areas. Um, I wanted to just point out that that, that re requirement of a, of a maximum FAR uh, can be eliminated entirely. There are many areas where there is no FAR limit. To effectively have is a form-based FAR limit, which is, which is automatically created uh, based on your height limit and your setbacks. Um, so, so, you know, you don't need to have to, uh, in order to we let uh, the other parts 
of the zoning uh, create a limit? And, and that would be, you know, with the, with the 14 foot uh, height minimum, you're, and the one by far, you're effectively having a, a one story floor. Um, so so you want to allow two story spaces there, you need a higher FAR limit and um, 14 foot ground floor height minimum requirement should be um, adjusted as well. Okay, thank you, sir. We appreciate your comments. And um, do we have any other speakers? Yes, we have a John Davis. Can you please state? Can you hear us here? Uh, yes, I can. Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, say I really appreciate Martha Miller for listening to our comments. I, I saw that uh, her changes and her uh, PowerPoint reflected our, our comments. So I very much appreciate it. And uh, Martha, you are awesome. Um, I also appreciate the commission for uh, listening and providing thoughtful discussion. Um, as it relates to parking, I just want to remind us how much. Uh, change we have seen and will continue to see in the way people live and the way they work uh, in the coming years. I, I just heard that Amazon shutting down most of its call centers, I think is five out of six. Maybe that's inaccurate, but I think that's what it was. Um, and they're allowing the employees to work from home. They're doing the same uh, with their offices and they've uh, stopped construction on three of the offices they've been working on. So I just think this is kind of, you know, leading the way that's not only the pandemic, but the is just leading the way to the way things will be. So I think for the good, we're going to end up with, at least in our downtown, we're going to end up, well, throughout actually, all of we're going to end up uh, having a lot of people uh, in the future working and living from home. So uh, it kind of relates to parking with this stuff. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a big supporter of easing parking, uh, you know, re uh, re uh, regulations, particularly as it applies to the downtown. Um, I would like to see mechanical lifts on lots of all sizes. Uh, it seems like it's a great solution if property, even if you don't uh, require parking, it's great if a property owner decides they would like to offer parking. It's a great uh, alternative uh, way to provide that. Um, you know, I'd also like to see, uh, I brought this up last time, see tandem parking, uh, you know, at least in our downtown, on smaller units, one bedrooms and studios. Uh, it may sound very strange because it's hard to wrap our brains around how we practically use that, but uh, I do want to say this would uh, allow developers and property owners to meet the perceived market demand. Uh, they're going to know that, and they're going to, you know, they're going to provide the units that are needed to actually rent out. Uh, so they are more familiar with uh, the market demand than we would be, um, and it also allows the uh, property owner or developer to reduce parking, and in doing so, they're essentially selecting. Uh, the potential tenants uh, to be ones that live and work downtown with minimum reliance on cars. And this is a very important part of vibrancy in the downtown in the future, I believe. Um, it's also uh, congruent with uh, our general plan and the vision. Um, along those same lines, I would like to see in the downtown uh, the allowance of uh, substituting a parking spot or two for some bike parking. Uh, you know, is part of the Roma report and is again in alignment with the general plan, which heavily leans on uh, living streets and reduction of car usage. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, my time looks like it's up. And uh, I thought Mark uh, Ballor's uh, uh, representative was great. I think he had some really good comments as well. And uh, uh, yeah, so I'd like to hear that. Thank you. Uh -huh. And we have uh, Laura Penna here to speak as well. Give me one moment. Hi, this is Laura. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Um, you sound like you're in an echo. Um, yes, this is Laura Pena. Again, I'm, I'm speaking, but I'd like to give specific um, comments in regards to the citywide standards. Thank you, uh, Martha, for making that clarification in regards to uh, us getting a track change document that will make it easier. One of the specific pieces of feedback that I'd like to see get addressed is, is the bicycle parking in more detail. Because currently how it's written, um, some of the recommendations don't seem to be realistic when it comes to our downtown. So if necessary, look at how um, bicycle parking with the stated size requirements 
how it can be incorporated into our downtown district, given the two feet of clearance needed to adjacent walls, poles, street furniture, drive aisles, pedestrian ways, and the requirement of at least five feet away from any vehicle parking spaces. So it just doesn't seem to be realistic. So I kind of wanted that to give a little bit more feedback. And I also agree that one of the recommendations out of the Roma study said vehicle parking requirements should be reduced in exchange for the provision of additional bike parking. So an equivalence of four biking spaces for one space. This is something that hopefully will be done as, um, as a recommendation to council to incorporate so that we don't have to have a specific parking plan for that recommendation. If it is something that can be done, then um, it, it should be a recommendation and it shouldn't require additional work. So um, in closing, I appreciate all your feedback and I appreciate uh, all the commissioners and staff working on these documents. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Do we have anyone else on Zoom that would like to participate in the meeting? Please raise your hand. Okay, um, we don't, I will note that we do not have anyone in chambers to speak. So um, given that I will close public comment at this time on this item. So now we need to come back and walk through this. I don't know if we wanna go page by page. Some of these have options for consideration and some are just a little more kind of um, declarative in terms of what we've decided. Um, do we wanna go first by the, does anyone have any questions or comments on the what we heard page? Do we wanna just go page by page, Martha? What would be most helpful to you? since you're distilling our, our awesome words into code. Martha, we can't hear you. All right, um, anyway, um, in, we'll, okay, we'll keep sorry. going. Oh, there, there you go. Do you, do you want us to go page by page or what's, what's best for you? Um, I think page by page uh, is an organized way to go through. Um, and so I just want to make sure, am I sharing the right slide right now, the what we heard? I'm seeing the what we heard slide. Okay, great. Did, Marie, do you have any comments on this, this page? Thank you, Chair. Uh, other than that, I think you heard what we said. So on the seven points enumerated on this slide, I would say um, that reflects my re uh, recollection of what we said, we, uh, how we weighed in on these items. So I'm a thumbs up on this slide, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Rob, any comments? Um, no, not at all. Actually, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Rice. All right, Vice Chair. I agree with Commissioner Rice. Pete? Ditto. <laughs> all right, just, um, all right, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, there's some wording from our past meetings that I'm sure you captured. So I think Jenner looks fine, so onwards. Um, okay, the slide on parking. Do you need any feedback from us on that or that's just more kind of informative? Just informative, letting you know what, you know, where we are in that and that we'll follow up with you. But as we figure out what major transit stop means. Yes, I know we're actively. <laughs> does, does anyone have any thoughts or comments on that? Page? I just yes, Commissioner Seaman does. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, Martha, do we have any idea how long it will take for that um, to determine what a major tra uh, transit stop is? I mean, is that a couple of days or a week or? I don't know. Um, the staff may have kind of a better handle. It seems weird that there would be interpretation, but unfortunately, sometimes with state law, the way it's written, it, it does take some extra thinking. Yeah, um, I totally agree because uh, <laughs> some years ago, this this came up too. And um, there was quite a bit of discussion about what exactly is a major transit stop. And obviously, since uh, Hermosa Beach is a little over a square mile, 
every place in Hermosa Beach could be within a half mile of a major transit stop. So anyway, I appreciate it. I just want to know if there was any idea about how long that might take. Do you need to have some thoughts on that? Um, sure. So there, there are some, some unclear items in, in bills as they come through and some end up in litigation and then some in successive sessions come back with amendments um, to clarify those, those gray areas. Um, we're still getting a handle on exactly um, the finer points to this legislation. Um, there are some um, there's some gray areas in terms of the definitions. So we're having the city attorney's office look at that now, and um, we should be able to get back to the commission within the next month or so. Uh, that brings up a good point. Uh, would it be up to the city attorney to make that decision or, or, or is it possible that we might be waiting for Sacramento to make the clarification? Well, I think, I think there will be a lot of attorneys weighing in on how this legislation affects um, different jurisdictions and the finer points of the bill itself. Um, so stay tuned. Could be both, okay, yeah. uh, thank you. Speaking of that, I, I see an attorney on my screen. Do you, John, <laughs> do you have any thoughts on this while we're here? I do, I just wanted to let you know that, um, you know, I know that Pat and um, you know the state attorney, Mike Jenkins have been working with the city um, upon news that this bill was signed. Um, and at uh, BBK, we have a special, um, housing group as well that is trying to dissect the complications of the bill um, itself. As you can imagine, the bill is very dense um, and there are exceptions and there are exceptions to those exceptions. Um, and so I think just before it's presented to the city with how this could shake out, we're just trying to figure out from a legal standpoint um, how this interplays with the city. Um, and as you could imagine with this state law, um, you know, this is affecting all cities. So I would imagine that there are some cities that, you know, won't be pleased with this. Some may be very pleased with this, um, but we just want to make sure um, that we understand how this affects Hermosa Beach specifically. Um, and so um, in terms of a timeline, I would imagine that sooner rather than later, just because of the impact of this um, bill, but um, as was noted earlier, this doesn't take effect until January 1st of next year. So there is there is some time. Okay. And just to give a little more um, color to it, John, I my source is telling me some of it has to do with how frequent the service is, how often, whether it goes to major mm -hmm. employment centers, et cetera. So that's kind of what the debate and definition is over. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. And, and as is noted in this slide, um, when you look at public transit um, in the in the code, it defines it um, and cites to a public resources code section. And so it's just, um, you know, I think as with a lot of state laws, it's it um, creates a lot of um, potential issues for um, interpretation. And so you are right that there's multiple definitions that kind of need to be hashed out and, and one of them is on this slide, the major transit, as well as what you referenced as well. Okay. We stand ready to hear how it shakes out. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on this or comments now? Right. Chair. Chair. Yes, I'm sorry. My hand was raised, I can't see it on my background. I, I, since we're on the topic, I, I wasn't gonna mention it if, it, if we were gonna sort of not discuss this slide, but I did have the good fortune of um, running into uh, State Senator Ben Allen last week. And in fact, we, I brought this up as a, one of a number of, of issues and we had a quick little discussion about major transit stop, et cetera, and how um, we were in the midst of a zone, you know, of our update and, and looking at, at parking requirements. and. We talked a little bit and his sort of off the cuff recommendation, in fact, is that we actually make no changes right down to our parking requirements and standards, um, seeing that more work needed to be done around this definition. So I asked if I could quote him and he said, absolutely. So I thought I would just share that with my colleagues. 
Um, I think that the way staff and city attorney is recommending that we approach this is the right one. We've seen uh, other bills come down with some sort of unclear definitions or you find them in several different sections of the code. So I just wanted to share um, what our representative up at the state house had to say about that. So we look forward to hearing more on this and I know that we'll get it back as we have before in the nick of time so that our code reflects uh, what state requirements, if any, as they affect our, our city. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide, which is alternative parking designs, Martha. Um, so this was really regarding the, um, I guess, tandem parking and mechanical lifts, but um, with the majority of the discussion being about mechanical lifts. And I know some commenters had some additional uh, feedback on this as well. Okay. Um, who wants to lead us off? Pete? Well, the one comment that, that was raised by uh, the public tonight, the question about mechanical lifts in non-residential would be permitted with a parking plan. I, in fairness, I, I can conceive of a, of a, I don't know where it would be, but a big project in which you would end up with effectively a parking garage and in that parking garage would in fact be lifts and whether that constitutes exposed or not exposed and what the aesthetics of that would be and where it was located, if it was a special, think of Skechers. If Skechers had an above ground parking on part of their project that was behind it away from the public view, wasn't imposing upon the adjacent neighbor, et cetera, et cetera, that I could conceive of where it would be appropriate for it not to be enclosed or maybe a car dealership, same kind of an idea. And so, but to the extent that there's a parking plan as part of that, it seems to me that the commission or whoever it would be, the discretionary, you know, discretionary agent uh, would have the ability to say, yeah, in that case, it's okay, on a, not a, enclosed in a different application. We would want it to be enclosed. So I'm comfortable not requiring that in a non-residential parking project with a plan that lifts would be permitted at the discretion of the commission. Uh, Chair Peterson. Yeah. So uh, down on 2nd Street and PCH behind Hermosa Saloon, there's a fairly large private parking lot. And the east side of that parking lot is parking for those retail businesses that front on the BCH, but the west side is for, I believe, those office condominiums. So, you know, there's an area that if that was new construction coming... Isn't that a city lot? I think that's that's a, is that a city, that city lot? City lot. Oh, yeah. It is a city lot. All, yeah. right. All right, well, I said corrected then, but it is out of view of the public, and if the city wanted to do that there, uh, I guess that's why it would be a parking plan that the commission could opine on, on whether or not, since it's not really in the public view, whether or not some sort of architectural covering or disguise would need to be, or maybe it wouldn't be because it's not in the public view. It, true. I mean, in that instance, it might be the noise, et cetera, might be challenging for that office building adjacent just to the West. So again, let me ask the question, the way our current code is stated, if someone came forward with a large development and they want to include mechanical lifts as part of a parking plan, is it currently allowed just subject to our vote? It is. Okay. All right. So we, so we could, all right. So, and if obviously if it was a large development would require a, um, a parking plan anyway. Um, Rob, do you have any thoughts on this? No, I think uh, no, other than to say that uh, it seems appropriate to uh, allow them if they come with a parking plan. Okay. Um, I'll just add, I, in terms of what we've given options to consider, I think for the, as drafted for the smaller lots required, that makes sense. Um, you know, additional parking, I'm okay with that. A lot of mechanical issues. I, 
I've not been the most enthusiastic supporter of lifts just because I think in some cases it reduces a garage size. In some cases, there may be a current tenant that is enthusiastic about it and then someone else buys it that wants nothing to do with it, but that's their parking. So, but I know that we can make changes over time if we see development or things happen a certain way. So I, I'm not in favor of it being, allowing it to be used for required residential parking at this time. Um, I think otherwise the comments here um, make sense. Chair sure, Peterson, yeah. I, I would concur the way that it's currently written. Uh, additional parking for the larger lots, but uh, not for the required portion. But, uh, excuse me, you're talking now about the smaller lots required parking or the big, the larger lots? The, the, the bigger, the bigger lots over 2,100. Right, right. For lots okay. under 2,100 square feet, it, as drafted, I think it's okay. Oh, okay. But the language where it says options for consideration, allowing it to be used for required right. residential on any size lot. Right, okay. okay. I'm in agreement then. All right, um, Commissioner Rice. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. So I, I guess I am I had a little bit of trouble following all that. So if, if everybody could just, for my, because I'm not there, could we just go down these bullets and everybody give a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Because I, I, I was understanding what you guys were saying one way, but now I think I had it wrong. So, for the draft provisions carrying forward on the lots under 2100, we're saying that the lifts may be used. So that carries forward. So if I understood it. My colleagues are agreeing with under 2100 that they may be used for required residential parking and that for over that size, they could be used for additional parking or required parking through a parking plan. And that mechanical list may not be used for guest parking. So if I heard it right, everybody agrees with those. Yes. And then, okay, and then dropping down to options for consideration. I think I heard unanimous support, although I haven't weighed in yet, on mechanical lifts be allowed to be used for required non-residential parking with parking plan approval. Do I have that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm in agreement with everything we've, we've, we've reviewed now. We're at the part where I'm a little confused. So I think where you, you just said you were not in favor of is mechanical lifts to be used for required residential parking spaces on any size lot, maintaining the exclusion of using the lifts for guest parking. And I think Pete agreed, do I have that? So you, neither one of you supports that one. Correct. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Um, you know, I, I could be open to, I, I agree with everything that's laid out here, carry forward the three. I agree with the um, non-residential. I think I could be open to the mechanical lifts um, on any size lot with exception. So maybe I'm standing out because I think, I think we've seen that these are working. Um, we haven't had any complaints where they are working. In fact, we know that that test case was on one of our narrowest streets and we've had no complaints that I know of um, from the neighbors in the, in the area there. So I, I guess I'll, I'll be different there and say I, I'd be open to looking at that. And if my colleagues wanted to put more conditions of approval on that, I, I, I'd be happy to look at those. Uh, thank you, Chair, for clarifying everybody. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I'm not seeing any additional debate on that, noting your, I guess we'll say objections or differences in terms of that. Um, but I think we'll move forward. And Martha, hopefully we've been clear with you in terms of what we prefer. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. On to bike parking. Um, so bike parking, I just wanted to add, and cause it was brought up by, um, one of the commenters and actually was brought up before too. So we did look at the uh, dimensions of parking spaces, bicycle parking spaces as well, particularly in the downtown um, area. And um, in the downtown, and um, we do need to expand this to include the, the RC district, 
but the bicycle parking spaces um, may be located within the public right of way with an encroachment permit, kind of reflecting the the limitation of of um, parking size and availability or lot size and availability area. Um, but you know, we reviewed um, recent uh, projects and permits and just the the development pattern in general, and we know that. One of the things that um, has been included in Coastal Commission um, approvals and stuff is uh, is requiring that bicycle parking. So um, we wanted to make sure it stayed in there and the space dimensions that are desirable stay in there. But again, recognizing the need for flexibility, there is um, an opportunity for director consideration of a modification to that if you know things are infeasible. Again, just making it work with the interest of getting as much bicycle parking um, as possible. The other piece on the parking, actual having reduction in the auto parking spaces, if you provide extra bicycle parking spaces, that is not included as a by right parking reduction. Right now, it would, as drafted, it would be something that could be considered as part of a parking plan for a parking reduction, but it's not. Um, as people have kind of uh, requested, it's not a, a by right, you know, four to one exchange. Um, so I just wanted to add that into the conversation. Okay. Um, does anyone have thoughts on this? I, I might have one, but I'll, I'll go first to Commissioner Rice because I don't want to forget you there out in the virtual world. Do you have any thoughts on bike parking? Yes, out here in the in the hinterlands. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So I I'm fine with the uh, new language here on the bullet. Um, understanding, Martha. Thank you for bringing Coastal Commission up. It affects a, a large swath of our city, and so it makes sense for those to have uh, you know have parity and be similar. So um, those requirements look the same for our property owners and developers, and if it's one rule rather than trying to weed through a number, which is why we're doing the update. Um, I would say I appreciated your comments about the idea of um, sort of bike spaces in lieu of parking. And I believe the way that we have it laid out at this time, that it is not by right, but it in fact would come forward as part of a parking plan makes sense because of the many different uses in our commercial zones and what that might look like and impacts um, that each of those operators might have in terms of how, how effective a bike space may be versus a space for a car, um, given the many different uses. And so I'm comfortable leaving that as is and having it come forward. And if somebody would like to have that exchange, I, I feel like that is the best way for it to come forward um, in a parking plan. So I'm good with the language you've sub, uh, submitted and fine with the way it is currently laid out. Um, in regards to the spaces, bike spaces for car spaces. Thank you, Chair. All right, who else has thoughts to share? Pete? Uh, that's an easy one. I would agree with Commissioner Rice. That we not have a fixed ratio, but we have discretion. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, seeing a cent on that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's good, Martha. I mean, the only other general comment, I. And this is more of maybe a public works comment. I just think in general, we should have a lot more parking, a lot more bike parking in town. I mean, I think it's it's helpful if you are, you know, parking in a building, you want it sort of covered, protected, et cetera. But I also think we should just as almost as like a utility, just have a lot more parking in town um, for bikes. If anyone uh, with a vote hears me, great. Um, all right, moving on to um, our next slide. Um, so this is the the time frame for replacement of non-conforming uses, and then also the benchmark for when you know um, you know that time frame begins. So the uh, kind of recommendation, I guess, is to extend the time frame to six months with the opportunity for additional uh, six month extension to that, and then um, you know that time period starts when any two of the listed items happen. Okay, I think this is better as drafted. I think it's a, a more 
you know, situations that are described here are going to be get a little bit chaotic. So I think this is a more kind of humane approach, if you will. Um, does anyone else wish to weigh in? I would concur. Okay. Okay. Seeing a lot of nodding heads here. Marie, do you have any thoughts? Just a a raised question. hand. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question for Jeannie then. Um, if we move forward with uh, this language as recommended, so that it's any two of the following occurs, I think that it, that's a, these are good uh, watermarks instead of the one. So I'm, ha I'm happier with this. If we move forward with six months and then the director may approve a one-time extension for six months, this seems similar to, I think what is our building, something in our building code that we just did last year, colleagues where it can be extended, the permit I think can be extended um, if there's, you know, obstacles, uh, things getting done, so that with the extension, a non-conforming use has that maximum of 12 months to be reestablished. So my question for staff would be, so at that point, then what, what's the timeline for um, moving forward if, in fact, not, the reestablishment does not happen, and in fact, this is this use is not coming back and it's going to be vacated or discontinued. How, what's the process after that and how long does that take? So if I'm understanding your question, if, if a site were to be then considered vacant or abandoned, mm -hmm. um, that site would then be subject to the current code requirements immediately. Immediately, um, okay. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've encountered this situation numerous times in, in my career. And, you know, I, I think the best approach is really that humane approach. Um, you know, there will be instances where a site might miss that six month by a week or two or even a month. And, um, you know, it's, it's really about the case by case situation, as long as we can document it and work with the property owner. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's best to kind of establish that communication and then move forward with a specific condition. But if if it were to truly be abandoned and the property owner had confirmed that and they had a new tenant or use coming in for the site, it would be subject to the, the current code requirements of what's allowed for the site. Okay. And my question really lies in how how much so we're going from 90 days to a year and that's I agree, it's a more humane approach and it makes sense, but that's, that's a pretty big stretch from where we were to where we're going. I think it's appropriate, but I just wanted to make sure that at the end of those 12 months, uh, there were triggers and mechanisms in place for then it to be cured and we, and we move forward. Um, and so the neighbors, be they commercial or residential, are, are not you know, looking at um, a vacated building or use. So those are my concerns. I think it's important for our public to, to know that as well. So I, as written and recommended, I, I, I support everything here on the slide. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Martha, I think on to the, there you go, on to the next one, condos. We, we talked about this, that, there, yeah. that w waiving a right was not appropriate, but there's maybe some nuance in terms of how, what sort of proportional representation a site would have. Is there language from other towns or how do we kind of zero in on what the right thing to do here is? Um, I think we kind of continue the conversation with the city attorney and just understand more of, of how these work, how they'd operate, what happens when there's like, condo um, conversion situation. I think part of it is that, you know, this isn't something we, or staff likely works with on a daily basis. So it's one of those that as it comes up, we need to do some more research on. But I think it is clear that the planning commission's kind of like barring um, something that would really kind of put the city in a bad spot, the planning commission's preference would be to take this language out, I think is what I'm hearing. Yes, and refine it. I would just, I, I don't, Chair, I don't see any refinement. I think it should just be out. 
there's the question that further research, just perhaps for our own curiosity, would be, when was the last time that we had a district form here in Hermosa? Wasn't it at the north end? And there must have been two unit condos there. You know, how were those treated? Uh, did each condo have a vote or was it one vote for the lot? And if so, how did each owner decide if one didn't want to do it and one did? But to a certain extent, that's none of our business. I mean, we're talking about property rights here. Right. So we can, we can strike this language as what's in front of us, but I think we've identified an issue that at least our innate curiosity needs right. to be addressed. And I would, of, I would be curious about it, but I, I think striking this language is the appropriate thing to do. Okay. In terms of what's in front of us, I would agree. Does everyone agree to that? Yeah. Marie, can I get a thumbs up? Okay. There we go. All right. And this was, and maybe this is just a report back, but it was, um, it was kind of an important thing in policy direction set with Plan Hermosa. So we did want to make sure we um, kind of revisited it and followed up with that discussion. Okay, noted. And I know there were some comments on the initial slide, the what we heard slide as well that covered us, some of the parts of that. All right. Um, I don't have any thoughts on that. No. I think we're good on that slide. There's the anything else slide. And then after that, you had a number of sort of nuanced kind of revisions and such. I don't know if we need to go through that. We certainly right. can if you feel we do. No, um, part of it was we did just, because we don't have track change language, we wanted to, the people who, you know, gave comments, we wanted to let them know we are going through them. And again, thank them for doing that and bringing the um, things up. It is very helpful and in, um, in kind of getting that other perspective. So just to be responsive, we wanted to make sure we included these. Okay. Yeah, Rob. Right. On this particular slide. Yeah. A uh, quick question. Uh, one, two, three, third bullet point, removing potential bedrooms from parking calculation, which I agree with, uh, but when we were discussing the uh, the parking requirements, didn't we decide to leave it straight across the board the way it is now? Yes, but you do have, well, um, and this is something we would get in. Okay, so this actually brings up a good question. So your current uh, requirements that we thought we'd revert to for senior and affordable housing, you did have parking requirements scaled by bedroom. In affordable housing and senior housing. Right. Okay, but in all other residential, uh, whether it's low re residential, low or medium and so on, that would all would refer back to exactly the way it was before. Yes. Okay, so this one, it's kind of a one sentence bullet point, of course. So uh, it refers to removing potential bedrooms from parking calculation, but that would still not, uh, affect senior housing and low-income housing. And as you said, just now, senior housing and low-income housing would still be based on, on the per-bedroom idea? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, any other comments on this slide? I don't have any. I'm not seeing anything from Commissioner Rice. No, look to my left, nothing. All right. Um, if you want to take us to the next step slide, then we'll know what uh, what we can speak to there in terms of process and well, next steps. Yes. Yeah, so um, again, the all of the draft preliminary draft standards that we've gone through um, that includes the citywide standards, the use regulations, the district and design standards remain available and on the website for review and comment, as well as with those available on the website are also the presentations from the follow-up meetings. So if people kind of wonder what was said and kind of discussed about those, they can check those out as well. Um, but again, throughout this process, those are open for, for comment and review and any questions you have of staff. So I wanna uh, put that out there for everyone. Um, and then the next thing that you will be seeing is a preliminary draft of the administrative procedures. So those are in process and um, we have a study session tentatively set to go over those for November 2nd. 
And that's the next step. Okay. So big picture, we'll, we'll go through those and then we'll kind of loop back through everything and, and you know, hearing and adoption. And um, I, I would say as someone that's been involved in the process, no, not as long as Pete often, but like no matter how long we take, no matter how much we publicize it, there are still people that, you know, say they haven't heard of it or heard of it late or wanted more feedback. So if you're involved in this process, tell a friend. Um, it's not the, you know, always the most riveting uh, reports to read, but it is important. It does inform how we develop our city and from, you know, how we shape our buildings, how we shape our community and our lives. So. Um, I would encourage you to get the word out. Um, and with that, I don't know that we have anything else other than adjournment, although. Chair, yeah. Chair Peterson, just a comment. Uh, we had a citizen comment this evening about recommending that we uh, revise the FAR calculation. And I want to make sure that my memory is correct. And if that citizen's still listening, uh, I believe several months ago, the commission expressed a desire to do that, uh, but that because it's in plan Hermosa, we could not tackle it directly, but rather, uh, and I'm looking at uh, Director Naughton now, sometime in the future, we would need to have a whole uh, separate set of public hearings to address that issue. We just can't do it as part of this. And do we actually even need some direction from the city council to, to do that? Sure, I'll weigh in on that. Um, and we we will also be revisiting the housing element update um, as well in, in the coming months. So there will be opportunity potentially to be talking about changes like that as part of, of that, those discussions as well. Um, but we, we would ideally want some direction from the city council um, if we were to embark on a separate discussion about making changes that are not I currently identified in the general plan. Well, I would ask my fellow commissioners then, is that something that we would recommend, want to recommend to the city that uh, they direct us and staff to pursue this particular item? I, I perceive at the time there was strong interest on the part of my fellow commissioners to revisiting this, but if we need to do appropriately a formal request of the city council to direct us to do that in staff, I'd like to see if there's a consensus to do that. Chair, if I could weigh in since yeah. we go ahead and be reviewing all of this and then moving forward to recommend adoption and then it's going to go to council. Council will see it at that time, so I don't I'm not in favor of a recommendation to do anything at this point since it's going to them and if they decide that's something they want us to take on, then we will and we'll go ahead and publicize those meetings and move forward with those public hearings. So I don't, I'm not really sure that that's necessary at that time because it'll be part of the process that's moving forward to them anyway. I don't know that my recollection is, is the same as my colleagues. And I also wanted to point out that the caller earlier from Ballor, I believe made reference to 14 foot ceilings and Commissioner Hoffman, correct me, on that one, I believe that we eliminated that, that we, we dropped that requirement. We lowered that or removed it. That Martin. was my recollection and I see Martha nodding. I think we did right. go through that and make some changes, right? I think part of the process too is once we get to the um, track that we can see all the changes made and then we're not pulling a thread out. I think that's a comment Martha made at the very beginning of the process. We look at the whole, we look at each piece. We do each, we take it in small bites, but then we have to take a step back and look at the whole thing. Because if you start pulling one thread, then a lot of other things sort of then need to be addressed. So I say we move forward in the, in the process that we've been going, let council uh, look at that when it gets to them later this year and then have them decide what they'd like us uh, if anything, if they'd like us to take another look and do additional public hearings. Thank you, Chair. Well, uh, Commissioner Rice, then I, I seek some clarification. Uh, what we're going to be sending them ultimately is an update to our zoning code and later on under a totally separate process, our housing element. Now, in the zoning code, um, we're not making any changes to the FAR ratio. We were told that we could not make any changes. So they're not gonna see anything in terms of the FAR ratio. 
But, well, Commissioner, it's part of the update. So it will be part, it, they'll see that it, there was no change. They'll, they'll see all the comments that we saw. I'm sure those involved that are, that are advocating that we make a change there would come forward and make comments on that much like they've done concurrently. And so like everything we've done, whether we have moved current code forward, just carried it forward, or we've changed language, they're going to see what it is and why. And in fact, I know several of them, if not all are, are watching um, and have been watching and are noting uh, what we have been doing. So to say that they won't see it because it didn't change, I don't, I'm not so sure that's a fair description of, of the process. If there's something that we have done that they don't agree with, I'm quite certain that, that it would, uh, they would be vocal about that and, and, and bring it up and then uh, send it back to us if that's something they wanted to change. Well, but we were told we could. I got a sense that the commission wanted to do something on the FAR ratio, but we were told we could not do anything because it's in the Hermosa general, in plan Hermosa. And to change and plan Hermosa requires specific direction then from the city council. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's true. Like the, the zoning and everything we're doing here conforms to plan changing FAR would be a change plan. I, I'll say I don't have enough detailed recollection of our debate and discussion there to have an opinion tonight. I know it's critical. Um, but I just, I would not, you know, to the extent we're voting on those, I wouldn't want to, you know, tip my hand one way or the other until I review our notes and what we talked about the last time. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, there has been many comments from the business community about raising the uh, floor area ratio. And since it cannot be done in this process that we're discussing right now, uh, I uh, kind of agree with Commissioner Azant that we should uh, look into what uh, and see if we can't get direction from city council, perhaps to go ahead and on a future meeting, put that on our agenda to discuss it. All right, Pete, what, what do you think? <laughs> Dave, I apologize, but I'm in the same boat you are. I'm recalling different, you know, different ideas about whether or not we wanted to go to the floor ratio or not. I think the caller actually made some comments that were, in some respects, the floor area ratio is really irrelevant to the extent that the building envelope is so well defined by the zoning code that in many cases it's kind of a irrelevant. Okay. Um, I mean, my recommendation would be that we sort of have a little sticky note on that topic as it comes through specific to the plan and plan conformance. And as we discuss that, which I have a hunch we will, um, that will inform what we may wish to, um, you know, request of council. Is that, I mean, I, I hear three people that are maybes or need to think about it here too that want to talk about. It. So I don't know if we need to, if two votes is enough to agendize that or if that's too much in the weeds for tonight i'd, I'd like i'm not opposed to it i just want to revisit it as part of our discussion or my own personal study before we make any request of staff if we wanted to bring it back as an item to review just informationally i wouldn't be opposed to that but that's different than making a recommendation to council to give us further direction which is what i heard from our vice chair Chair, if I, if I may just jump in here, um, I, I think for probably purposes of tonight in terms of um, Brown Act, I think that the uh, option would be to just consider putting it on a future agenda. I don't know if how this item was agendized, which is- It wasn't. Was not. Right, it's it just, not an informational item. I, I don't know how this would- be able to be um, an action taken for any sort of recommendation. So I think if the consideration was a future agenda, that's fine, but I don't know if it could happen with a, an actual recommended action. Understood. All right, um, so noted that there's, I guess, interest to, dis to debate this further and perhaps um, offer some direction if staff could at the appropriate time, whether in one of our future zoning meetings or one of our regular meetings, bring this back for discussion and some context. If we could do that, I think we would uh, 
I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. I, I just okay. want to make sure it doesn't disappear from our agenda. I'd, I'd rather do it sooner. There's a greater consensus that it should be done at a later time in a different context. I'm fine with that. I just don't want to let it disappear because my own personal thing is I think it needs some revision. Okay. So I just want to make sure that it happens. It will come back on our agenda. Um, all right. And th I thank you for bringing that up and um, to uh, Mr. Buller's representative as well. Um, anything else, or if not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. Second. All right. We'll take a voice vote. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All right. See you in a